All right, the, what I want to do is just, well, I'll just, just say one thing because I, I feel more comfortable when I say it, is that I never planned to write any of these books. I never planned to do anything like this, never planned to be speaking to a lot of people. It's kind of like, um, I've said this before, it's like walking down a street and a parade is formed behind me. It's kind of uncomfortable to me in a way. Uh, and, and I just like to say that I'm sure each of you could be up here talking about something. It just happens that you've come to hear me talk about this. But um, I think I, I, I like us to feel kind of equal and connected <laughs> rather than me um, parading around like the big deal here. Anyway, because <laughs> now I'm going to do that. <laughs> now I'm going to now I'm going to give you a lot of information, some of which you may have heard before, but it'll be a little different. And also, you all need it again and again and again. And it actually has changed a lot from when I wrote the book. And not the trade at all, but the way that I talk about it and think about it. And in the book I said this, but it's much clearer now that this trait is found in in a minority of people, but a substantial minority, about 20%. And it's found in at least 100 species besides humans. And so we now know, you know, and this is new, this idea of personalities within, within a, a species, that there could be two types rather than just one ideal. You know, we used to think in evolution that, that everything is sort of merging towards the perfect animal in that particular environment. But now we know that there often are two types that are, that are there. One is more numerous than the other, always. And the two strategies, one is to be very responsive and pay careful attention to everything that's going on, and the other is not to bother. <laughs> and you might say, well, of course, it's better to pay attention, but it isn't always, because sometimes there's nothing really that you can learn from this situation that applies to the next situation. And then you've, you've wasted your energy, basically. And we all know, as sensitive people, that there is energy that is taken up by being so observant and processing everything so deeply. So there are advantages to both strategies. It depends on the situation. But uh, the, the man who did the nice computer simulation of how this would evolve in all different species, Max Wolf, he's in Germany, and, and you know, he just did this on his own, and I found, we found each other, but he was not thinking about my book. He was thinking about animals. And in fact, the animal people are very interested in us as another species, because here, here the species has this, this, you know, then that, that seems that it's possible that all these other species would really have what they're looking at, too. And you can't talk to um, the the monkeys and the fruit flies and the, and the pumpkin seed sunfish and all these different species that, that's been found in, but we can talk to humans. But, so his point is that um, if everybody were highly sensitive, then there would be no value in it. So his example is if there's a patch of grass that's especially nutritious and all the cows go to that patch of grass and eat it, then there's no benefit for anybody. But if only some of the cows notice that there's a patch of grass that's particularly tasty, then they get the benefit of it and the others don't. But if there's no special patch, then it doesn't matter. I, the example I like is that uh, if there's a traffic jam, because this is me, I always know all the shortcuts. I know routes through town that no, nobody else knows. But if everybody knows them, then they're not shortcuts anymore. So. You're not going to hear about mine. <laughs> I live in Marin anyway, so. Uh, so, like, one early example that, that I like is of uh, pumpkin seed sunfish. And a, a person who's become a friend of mine, David Wilson, did this study. And so they had a pond, and they had all these pumpkin seed sunfish, and they put traps in the pond, and some of the fish went into the traps, and some did not. So they called, this is, this is, the problem with naming a trait. And they called the ones that went into the trap the bold sunfish and the others the timid sunfish. Well, I teased him, why didn't you call them the stupid and the smart sunfish? <laughs> <laughs> but timid has stuck, unfortunately, in the animal world. But, but uh, Max Wolf is pushing for responsiveness because that's what he thinks the trait is. And responsiveness is a good term, so maybe we'll end up being highly responsive people. The, the, term, the, the name doesn't really matter, except that people have said to me, well, how could you have inv 
you know, discovered a new trait. <laughs> I said, I did not discover a new trait. The only thing that changed was I happened to be on the inside as a, as a psychologist. Somebody said to me, well, you're highly sensitive. And I thought, what is that? I had never thought about myself that way or ever had the term. But I began to think about it, and then I interviewed other people. And you know, you can't... One thing I learned in Bamberg, Germany, teaching these university uh, business students was they couldn't figure out how they were going to know if someone was highly sensitive if they didn't take the self-test. Well, why is that? Because sensitive people are not that visible. We tend to, we tend to adapt most of the time. W people who live with us know that we're highly sensitive. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But, but we can often hide it in other places or we choose environments where it's not a, a problem for us. So this invisibility factors made it very hard for people to, to dis discover this trait without really getting inside the minds of sensitive people. We've done that now with, um, with magnetic resonance imaging studies, which I will tell you about. So now we, we've got the picture. But before that, we're talking about inhibitedness. A lot of people thought it was the same as introversion. But just to reassure the extroverts in the audience, it's not the same as introversion. About 70% of highly sensitive people are introverts, but a healthy 30% are extroverts. So that's an important thing to, to know. There were times when people said that it was like neuroticism, but it's not neuroticism, which is a tendency towards anxiety or depression. And sensitive people who've had a difficult childhood are more likely to be anxious and depressed. But if you haven't had a difficult childhood, the new research is that you're less likely to be anxious or depressed than other people. So that's, that's one of the exciting things that's also happening, and that is the publication of an article called Vantage Sensitivity, which um, is published in a really good scientific journal, and I'll describe uh, that more to you. Getting back to one more animal example, uh, there was a, quite a while ago a man named Sumi who, um, I think it was in 1995 that he was doing this research to begin with. He was studying rhesus monkeys, who um, turns out there are some that he called uptight and the, some that are laid back. <laughs> and the, the uptight ones, you can figure out who that they were. They were more uh, easily stressed out. So, but he wanted to see what would happen if you cross-fostered them and gave them to very skilled mothers or just ordinary mothers at birth. So as soon as he figured out which kind they were, he would, direct, he would give them to a different type of mother. Well, it turned out that the uptight monkeys, and I don't think he calls them that anymore, um, became the leaders of the troops when they were raised by skilled mothers. So this is the whole picture that's emerging, is that sensitive people have tremendous advantages. And so that's why it's a joy to be highly sensitive. We just, it was kind of masked, and I wasn't seeing it. I did my research showing that people with a troubled child, sensitive people with a troubled child, had more anxiety and depression, but without it, they were more, no more likely than non-sensitive people to be depressed or anxious. But it never occurred to me to look at the positive end of the scale, because I was just hoping to demonstrate we weren't any worse off than other people. <laughs> and I don't want it to go in the direction of a, us being superior, and that's actually an anxiety that I'm beginning to have. I don't want people to feel superior. That's why I like Janine Ramsey's four types, because each has its value in a company. Each has its value in the world. And, and although, Evolutionary people do not like to talk about survival of groups. They only like to talk about survival of individuals. I'm sure that the human race and, and families and all kinds of social groups have benefited from the combination of a sensitive and non-sensitive people in their midst. And I won't, I don't want to keep digressing, but a, a man named uh, Jay Belsky, Michael Pluis and Jay Belsky, came up with this whole idea of differential susceptibility, looking at our re research and a lot of other research on genetics and infants who are difficult or, or negative, all these different studies in which they found that with a good environment they did better than others. So they were very interested in, in that outcome. And Jay Belsky actually has a, a theory that uh, he's at the University of 
California at Davis. He has a theory that in every family, it's an advantage to have one highly sensitive child and one not sensitive child, so that if one survives, the, you know, if the environment is best for one, um, then, then it'll survive or thrive, well, even if the other doesn't, which is a very interesting theory. I've kind of teased him about, okay, so how does the mother's womb know what kind of baby she had first? He says, I don't care about mechanisms. I just, it's true. <laughs> so we'll see. So the way I've been talking about sensitivity lately, and it came out of my writing my book on um, psychotherapy in the highly sensitive person, which is if anybody's a therapist or anybody has a therapist, <laughs> slip them the book, because <laughs> it's, it's, uh, therapists have been kind of slow to understand about this. So I came up with an acronym, which D-O-E-S, which you can think of as DOES, if you're a woman, or does if you're a man. I don't care. <laughs> it just happened to work out. D-O-E-S worked very well. And the first one is depth of processing. And this is the fundamental thing about us, is that we process information more deeply than others. And everything else kind of flows out of that. And we know this, um, I mean, kind of, it's obvious in the Max Wolf's ideas and, and my interviews and the questionnaire, but We've been able to do what are called fMRIs, functional magnetic resonance imagery, so that you have somebody in the MRI machine and they're doing something. And so one of the studies we've done is shown people pictures um, that are only slightly different, and we find that the sensitive people's brain activation, in particular areas um, that have to do with deeper processing or more elaborate processing, perceptual pro those are the areas that are, are being activated. Uh, so that's an example of a, another one that I really like is a cultural study where they know that people in different cultures look at things differently. And actually, if you just have a box with a line in it, different sized boxes and different sized lines, people who come from a collectivist culture like, like in Asia, they have trouble seeing the difference in the size of the lines, but they can see the difference in the size of the boxes. People come from in from U.S. and from from more individualistic cultures can figure out the difference between the lines, but not the boxes. I know it sounds crazy, but they had already demonstrated this, and in fact, they had demonstrated this in an fMRI. My husband was in on this research, so he slipped in the HSP scale to all the people in the study. It turned out for the highly sensitive people, their culture did not affect their ability to see the, these differences. In other words, their culture just wasn't affecting them. So that's another example of how we're processing things more deeply. And I think it's, it's quite fascinating to think we don't even usually use the full scale. We just take like 10 items from it. And, yet, and you only use like eight subjects in, a, in an MRI study, like five in each group or 10 in each group or something like that. You don't use a lot of subjects. We still get significant differences in the brain, the way the brain is operating. So depth of processing. The second one you're all familiar with, O, is for easily overstimulated. That's the downer of the straight for sure, getting easily overstimulated, overaroused. If there's anything that's known for sure in psychology, it's what's called the optimal level of arousal, that if you are too bored or too overstimulated, you don't function well. You function best in the middle. So, but people reach their optimal level at different, different uh, rates because sensitive people are processing things more and they get overstimulated more. So that's why you probably have the experience of taking a test or being observed or practicing and then going to perform and you don't do well and it's so frustrating because you know, you know you're good, but you can't show it to anybody else because you got over aroused. And uh, it's, a, it's a huge problem for us, I'll admit. It's also what makes a lot of us shy is because you can think of brilliant things to say when you're at home, but then you go out and you're at a party and, and there's all this stimulation and you can't think and you can't think of anything to say and then you feel people think you're dumb and you don't want to go again and then it gets worse and worse. So. <laughs> okay. So um, the, third one, the, the, the third one is E for being emotionally reactive or responsive. 
and also for empathy. And this is, uh, again, we've been able to, I mean, when I wrote the book, I didn't want to talk a lot about emotion, us being very emotional, because I thought it'd make us kind of sound neurotic or something. <laughs> but I knew we were. We cry easily. We, the only reason cries easily is not on the test is because men don't answer yes to that as much as women do. I don't think I ever said this, by the way, but there are just as many men as women born highly sensitive. Absolutely no doubt about that. It's just a lot harder for men, and it's uh, and in some cultures, they, they hide it pretty completely, but not in this area. <laughs> Good. Um, so this emotional reactivity, I found this lovely article on uh, someone rethinking cognition and emotion, which they said, cognition, thinking, is impossible without emotion because you won't think about anything for any amount of time at all unless you are interested in it for some reason. And furthermore, if you have an experience and you need to learn from it, you'll learn from it only as much as you think about it afterwards, and you'll think about it afterwards only as much as you cared about what happened. So it's quite brilliant, isn't it? So then this makes sense that we have to have stronger emotional reactions in order to process things more. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. So they're absolutely linked like that. So back to the MRI machine, we have found that since, the, so we've done two studies, one in which people were looking at pictures that are supposed to create emotions like snails and snakes and spiders and puppy dogs and birthday cakes and things are supposed to create different emotions. Well, it turns out that sensitive people are responding more, more quickly and w with more activation to to these um, emotional kinds of pictures. Interesting thing was we found that actually they responded more to the positive than to the negative pictures, which then starts to explain this vantage sensitivity phenomenon because if sensitive people are, are picking up on both positive and negative, but everybody picks up on negative because we wouldn't survive if we didn't notice what we were afraid of and what made us sad. And, but that some people are paying more attention to the positive, it just really indicates this greater in, in responsiveness. Another study that was done was having people look at their, rom my husband studies romantic love, and <laughs> so, so this one was of people being in the scanner looking at pictures of their beloved or of a stranger and either a happy, sad, or neutral expression. And sensitive people looking at anyone with a happy or a sad expression compared to neutral showed more activation, but especially when their partner was showing a happy expression. That was the strongest result. But the most interesting thing was where they found the activation. And there's something that was discovered only about 20 years ago called mirror neurons. I don't know if you've heard of mirror neurons, but some of you have <laughs> been in school recently. Uh, mirror neurons are a part of the brain that they first discovered in monkeys where if, if, um, someone's, if someone kicks a ball, your brain fires as if you had kicked the ball. And if someone says kick, that same neuron fires. If you hear a ball being kicked, that neuron fires. Now, fortunately, there's another part of the brain that says, uh-uh, that was not you, that was somebody else. <laughs> but these mirror neurons are what give us empathy, what allows us to read people's minds and to predict what people are gonna do. It allows us to trick people, among other things. I mean, empathy is useful for many things. But among other things, it's good for making people feel better. And sensitive people have more empathy and they have more activation in the mirror neurons. So, the other, I was teaching a course at Kripalu in the spring, and somebody said, oh, I'm so tired of picking up on what everybody else is feeling. It's like I can't separate my feelings from other people's feelings. And I hear this a lot, and so I said, well, how many in the room feel this way? And there were, by the way, 80 people. That was not what we planned, but there were 80 people for this weekend of highly sensitive people, but they didn't notice that they were filling up. So 
At any rate, I asked every person in the room, as far as I could tell, put their hand up that they all feel other people's feelings, and they're all moaning about it. And I said, well, these are your mirror neurons. This is what allows you to read people's minds, to know what's going on, what people are going to do, to be helpful to them. Two, if you want to be sneaky, I mean, you don't realize that you have this except when it's inconvenient, but it's, it's a powerful tool. The other thing, and this is really strange, is if there's a part of the brain that has been termed the seat of consciousness because it integrates all the mo everything that's going on in the moment, like where I'm standing, what I'm seeing, what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, all the stimuli around, it all goes into a place called the insula, a little place in the brain called the insula. It turns out that sensitive people have more activation in their insula. We hadn't even looked there before, but we saw it in this study, and it turns out to be there in other studies too. So we could just be so nasty as to say that we're simply more aware than other people. We're not going to go out talking like that, but I do, <laughs> I do think it's good first to raise our self-esteem and then level it out a little bit, okay? So there's special things that are going on in our brains. And um, the last of these DOES is being uh, aware of subtle stimuli. And we've, because my husband does MRI studies, he looks at where love is in the brain, we, we haven't done very many behavioral studies. If, if anybody's a graduate student in psychology or thinking they'd like to become one, please see me because we need, we need more research done. But at any rate, uh, in, in, in this study, okay, where'd I go? I just went somewhere. Where was I? Oh, subtle stimuli, yes. So there aren't very many of these simple behavioral studies, but this one is done by a man named Gerstenberg in Germany. And he simply had people looking at a screen where there were L's and T's in among other shaped things that could have been taken for L's and T's but were not. And you have to identify the L's and T's upside down and sideways and everything from the other things. And this is a standard kind of test of reaction time and ability to observe details. Sensitive people did much better than the non-sensitive people on this. Interestingly, they were also more stressed afterwards than the other people were. <laughs> so there you go again. It's a trade-off. But this, uh, and of course, uh, the brain studies too have been showing this sensitivity to subtle stimuli, which in all the brain studies we get, we get this deeper processing in these parts of the brain that have to do with um, the visual association areas, secondary visual areas, visual motor coordination areas. Those are they're fancier terms than that. I'm not even going to bother with those. So um, that's most of the research. I haven't talked yet about the genetics, and I'll do that briefly. Um, people always said, well, how do you know this was innate? And I said, well, because I just know. <laughs> and other people had said this, and then there were the animal things. I have a problem with research in that I, I tend to think I know, and I don't want to go through the steps of doing the research because I feel I already know, and I do generally know, but we still have to do the research, so that's taken a long time to get this done. <laughs> but uh, uh, there are some genes that have to do with serotonin. And you all know about serotonin, the select, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors that squash depression. So serotonin was always thought to probably be related to depression and anxiety. And in fact, there are three alleles. Alleles are the things that decide, say, whether you're going to have blue eyes or brown eyes. So they're normal, but they're different. So there are three alleles for serotonin. One is the short, short, one is the short, long, and one is the long, long. And if you have the short, short, you're more prone to depression. But every time they'd go and do a study and look at all the people with short, short alleles, they found that they weren't all depressed. So, all, so you know, for a long time, they could not figure this out. Finally, they got it that if you had a troubled childhood or stressful life, and you had the short, short allele, then you were going to be depressed. But if you hadn't had any of that happen, you'd, you, the short short allele wasn't a problem. Then a few people got really clever and thought, well, what is it there for that about 20% of people have this? Well, they found out the people with the short short allele 
process information <laughs> more carefully. <laughs> they make better decisions in gambling experiments in the laboratory, um, where they, you know, they just have people making decisions and based on how much money they're going to win and lose. So it's like sensitive people are more careful when they're going to lose money and more audacious when they think they're going to win money. And the more money, the more bold they get, but also more cautious they get. My family used to drag me to the racetrack because I loved horses and I could look at them and figure out well, who, which one was going to win, but I hated the betting because I didn't want to lose. <laughs> it, was, it was never a, a lucrative enterprise. <laughs> so the other genetic study was a nice surprise for me. So we found that sensitive people are more, people who score high on the, on the scale are more likely to have the short, short, and the short, long allele. It is not the only story, however. Off in China, I did not know this was going to happen. I, then I suddenly, some, you know, the article shows up that these uh, group of scholars in China w had observed that the personality measures that we have, one of the most popular being the big five. I don't know if you've heard of the big five, but uh, um, it's introversion, extroversion, neuroticism, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and open-mindedness. And these have been very popular for quite a while. And there are other personality tests like the Myers-Briggs. But when you give those to people, we know that personality is highly inherited from twin studies. And, and identical twins are more likely to have a similar personality than fraternal twins. And twins raised apart, twice as twins raised together and all this stuff. But when you actually give the test and you look at the genes, you don't, there isn't very much correlation between the tests and the genes. So... Maybe they were looking at the wrong traits. So, so this, uh, these, uh, this Chinese team discovered high sensitivity and they said, oh, this sounds like it's deeply rooted in the physiology. So they used it and, and then they just looked at all the dopamine genes. In China, people are not as interested in serotonin as they are in dopamine. I think partly because there's more of this short, short allele in, in Asian countries. At any rate, they looked at dopamine and there are 78 dopamine alleles, but they found that 10 of them um, were highly related to the, to the HSP scale at the kind of level that you would predict from what's known about personality and genetics. So there are some dopamine genes also involved, and I think there's gonna be a lot of genes because there are hundreds of genes that govern personality and we don't know much about them. In fact, the dopamine genes they found were not ones, for the most part, that anyone knew had anything to do with personality. So we're still discovering all kinds of things. So I think I've worn you out on research, although I could tell you more. <laughs> uh, one more favorite story. Since we're talking about, <laughs> since we're talking about the short, short allele too. Well, one, one is that they found that rhesus monkeys is the only other species that has this allele, and that rhesus monkeys with the short allele, they just have short and long, um, are, are the same, the uptight ones. But also, when they have this, they are well, superior cognitive perform a wide range of, I can't remember quite the phrase, a broad range of superior cognitive performance, something like that, for rhesus monkeys too. This is very interesting to, to me. That, and this guy said, maybe the adaptability of rhesus monkeys, because they can live almost anywhere on Earth, and human beings, is because we have these two alleles that allow the more responsive ones to figure out how to adapt and the others imitate it. It's an interesting idea. The, the Michael Pluis, who is a Swiss guy and I think I dare say highly sensitive, <laughs> one of the things that's happening is like people who are very talented and doing very well in the world are starting to say they're highly sensitive when before they weren't. <laughs> and in fact, they didn't even realize they were until until, like Michael, got involved in this uh, differential susceptibility research. He did, okay, I'm going to tell you two more studies. One with the HSP scale that he did. He, um, there was an intervention being done to teach teenage, young teenage girls to be more resilient so that when they were older, they would not get depressed because teenage girls tend to get depressed in their teens. So they did this program, then they watched the girls, and it gave them all the HSP scale, too, at the beginning. Turned out that only those who scored in the upper third of the HSP scale got anything from the program. The others didn't get anything from it. 
So now Jay Belsky, who was kind of the, the bad boy in psychology, is going around saying that, it's, that all the interventions we've been doing all these years to help people have only been working on sensitive people. <laughs> And we either had to change the interventions or save our money and just use them on sensitive people. So, I mean, that's what I mean by the whole energy is changing. An SS allele study that's really interesting is, you know, these Romanian orphans, um, there's still too many of them, and so they put some in orphanages, and they have a random lottery as to which ones will get put into foster care homes that are very skilled, that can take care of these kids that have already been in orphanages for a while. So they, they, they put them into foster care, they leave them in the orphanage where they've, they've been for a while. Turns out only the children with the short, short alleles get any benefit from being in foster care. The others don't. At 54 months, the ones with the short, short alleles have, have changed their social behavior and the others haven't. So, I mean, one of the good things is that for people who've had a difficult childhood, which you used to feel like if you're highly sensitive, you had a difficult childhood, bye-bye, you're just going to be depressed and anxious your whole life. No, actually, it, it looks as though we're especially responsive to, to therapy and self-help books and the, the various things that we all try to do to get our act together. So it seems like sensitive people get more from that. 